Firstly, a bit of a reminder of the journey from antiseptic to aseptic surgery. I've got a full video on 19th century surgical developments in my rapid revision playlist for medicine through time. But very briefly, in the late 19th century, there were further advances in surgery. German scientist Robert Koch discovered that steam sterilized surgical tools better than acid. There was therefore a move away from trying to kill the germs, such as with Lister's carbolic acid, to trying to make sure that there were none there in the first place. And so with antiseptic germ uh, surgery, there are germs in the operating theatre, but these are killed before they can infect wounds. Whereas with aseptic surgery, equipment and clothing are sterilised with steam. There should not be any uh, germs present in the operating theatre at all. So how possible was aseptic surgery in the conditions of the First World War? Source B shows a photograph of an aseptic operating theatre in 1910 whereas source C is a photograph of an operating theatre in a temporary hut at a casualty clearing station in around 1916. You'll notice that there are several compromises. Firstly, in order to get enough light, yes, there is electric light, but there are also large windows. These might be a vector for germs entering the operating theatre, though. Another is the surgeon's hands. These appear to be in rubber gloves, which would help with aseptic surgery, just as you can see in the first image. However, you'll notice that there is a mixture of equipment here. The surgeons themselves appear to be wearing hair coverings and they appear to have stopped at that. They don't appear to be the face coverings that you can see in the other image. Other people, like the medical orderly in the background, are just wearing their usual uniforms and they haven't taken those precautions. Again, this is an example of a compromise. But there are, just as in the previous photograph, assistants helping with the, um, the operation. In many cases, these were women. And we can see the anaesthetist at work here, probably ready to up the dose of a particular anaesthetic, perhaps chloroform, while the operation is in place. So there aren't many similarities between the aseptic surgery in peacetime and the aseptic surgery that was attempted in wartime. But it's perhaps not true aseptic surgery, as certain compromises have had to be made because of the conditions of wartime. But nevertheless, it is an attempt to provide a safe, clean and efficient operating theatre. One dramatic example of how advanced surgery could be in the First World War would be the work of Harold Gillies and his facial reconstruction surgery. The First World War saw many soldiers wounded by shrapnel, or shell sprinters, and bullets. Shrapnel caused unbelievably gruesome wounds, but it was not always fatal. Harold Gillies was a New Zealand Royal Army Medical Corps surgeon, and he developed something that he called plastic surgery. In this case, plastic refers to the idea of something being mouldable, as, if you think about it, plastics are. Gillies didn't actually use plastic materials. Instead, he used skin grafts to remould or reconstruct the faces of the wounded. We're going to have a look at some examples of this. As a bit of a warning, these images may be a bit distressing. I've tried to manage things, and this is real history, so try and stay with it if you can. If not, skip on a minute or two, and we'll be past it. Our first patient is a badly wounded pilot from the First World War. You can see that his eyes and face have been almost entirely burnt off. And our second patient has got a deep shrapnel wound which has taken off the, virtually the entirety of his nose. Both of them were very seriously wounded, but we're going to see how this was dealt with, starting with our pilot. This series of images, and I've used arrows to indicate the order of the treatment, show how the face was gradually rebuilt using skin grafts. So we go from the original condition of the patient, to the grafts being started to move over the face. And eventually the face is remoulded, the nose rebuilt, until by the end we've even got some eyebrows coming along. This shows that actually the treatment was not yet over, but as time went on these scar scars would become less visible and the appearance would become more natural. But I'm sure you'll agree that it is a much more natural appearance than part one. So this soldier has been really quite extensively helped by the plastic surgery techniques. In the following two cases, we will be able to see the tubed pedicles technique. Here, flesh was gradually moved from place to place with blood vessels still connected until it was where it was needed. It was then molded to shape and left to heal. Here's how it worked. In the case of William Vicarage, tubed pedicles have been used to rebuild his lower jaw, which had been destroyed by shrapnel. Grafts of skin have been moved to the jaw from the shoulder. Effectively, the tubes are gathered up with the blood vessels inside to keep the flesh from going bad and rotting. One side would be cut and then moved further up the body. And then once that had healed and the blood vessels were secure, the other side would be cut and it would be moved further up the body again, effectively allowing the graft to walk end over end. 
like I say, a bit like it's walking, hence the term tubed pedicles. The results of William Vicarage's uh, treatment, despite looking fairly gruesome, were actually incredible. Here he is a little bit later in life. You can see that his lower jaw has been largely rebuilt and the profile from the side is virtually normal. Incredible given the, the techniques available at the time. So let's have a look at another example. We've seen this man before, William Spreckley, who sadly suffered a, a very severe facial wound from shrapnel. His nose was virtually entirely destroyed and his skull was cracked. There's also the tube pedicles technique here. A graft of skin from his forehead has been moved down, still connected to the blood vessels. Here it looks unnaturally swollen. But check him out when he's in his 60s some years later. Yes, there's some asymmetry to the face, but the scars are barely visible at all. An incredibly successful procedure. That's the last of the really graphic images, but I think they quite graphically show how much surgery developed in the First World War. Plastic surgery, though, wasn't always attempted. Instead, artists like Captain Wood here were employed to make realistic faceplates. It should be recognised that surgery like that performed by Gillies was the exception rather than the rule. Much of his work was truly pioneering and experimental. That said, the advances made would be useful in peacetime and would further benefit uh, later from the development of antibiotics, which would help prevent infection even further. These techniques would also be further refined and perfected, more famously really, by Archibald McIndoe in the Second World War. Another significant advance was in brain surgery. Have a look at these sources showing soldiers in the trenches. Why might there have been so many head injuries in World War I? Well, first of all, trenches were open to the air at the top. That meant that if a soldier was caught out and shrapnel rained down into the trench, he could expect to get a head wound. So as we can see in the middle photograph, soldiers were later issued with steel helmets. But after the steel helmets were introduced in 1916, head injuries actually went up. More people survived head wounds, that's why, although they did so with severe injury. Previously, these people would have actually been killed. So the injuries goes up, but that means the number of people surviving went up too. Good news. Brain surgeons barely existed before World War I, and there was little knowledge of how the brain actually worked. But, incredibly, some new techniques were developed during the war. One of the pioneers of early brain surgery was Harvey Cushing. Few World War I surgeons had experience of neurosurgery, but one exception was American doctor Harvey Cushing. Through his work, experimentation and careful observation, the effectiveness of brain surgery improved. So Cushing observed that men who were operated on quickly were more likely to survive. So specific casualty clearing stations became chosen as centres for brain surgery. During the Battle of Passchendaele in 1917, all head injuries were sent to the CCS at Mendenham. The observation also was that it was dangerous to move men too soon after an operation. Patients remained at the CCS for wee three weeks after the surgery, which allowed the swelling of the brain to go down. It was observed that seemingly minor wounds could be hiding more severe injuries. That meant that all head wounds were carefully examined to realise their full extent. It was observed that general anaesthetics caused harmful brain swelling. And so Cushing used local anaesthetic, keeping the patient awake, to avoid this. It was seen that infections still affected head and brain injuries the same as they would do elsewhere on the body. So action was taken to prevent and treat infections during and after the surgery. Cushing's improvements really worked. The general survival rate for brain surgery in World War I was only 50%, but for Cushing it was 71%. That's a 21% improvement, or one in five men more tended to survive with Cushing than with other surgeons. So he really knew his stuff. This source helps give us an idea of some of his techniques. This is from A Soldier's Journal, 1915 to 1918, by Harvey Cushing himself. It was published later in 1936. Here he is describing the conditions under which he is working during the Battle of Passchendaele on the 19th of August 1917. My prized patient, Baker, with a shrapnel ball removed from his brain, after doing well for three days, suddenly shot up to a temperature of 104 last night, about midnight. I took him to the operating theatre, reopened the perfectly healed external wound, and found to my dismay a massive gas infection of the brain. I bribed two orderlies to stay up with him in the operating room, where he could have constant and thorough irrigation over the brain, and then through the track of the missile, 
which meant passing a warm saline or salt water solution along the path taken by the shrapnel to prevent infection. No light except candles was permitted last night. From what I've been able to establish, Baker actually survived, and the infection was removed. Some final points on the improvements to surgery then. The First World War further accelerated progress in surgery and built upon the advances made during the 19th century. Truly, aseptic surgery was virtually impossible in some World War I circumstances, so antiseptics were used alongside aseptic techniques to prevent infections as far as possible. Facial reconstruction or plastic surgery was developed by Harold Gillies using tubed pedicles to move grafts of skin and flesh without infection or letting the flesh die, although this remained reasonably unusual. There were also advances in brain surgery techniques which were developed by American surgeon Harvey Cushing. While these techniques were rare and experimental, their success rate was impressive, and they would have a significant impact on surgery in peacetime too. That's the end of this rapid revision session looking at surgery in World War I. I hope that it's given you everything that you've need and you've found it useful. If it has, please like the video and subscribe to the channel for more. But for now, I'll say thank you very much for watching and goodbye.